Michael, in my opinion, will play with him for so many years. He was just the ultimate competitor, man. And and aside from being on the court, like I, we were playing cards at my house one day in Charlotte. Here's another story: playing cards at my house one Tell day in Charlotte. All the stories, okay? We have all the. This time. is how this, this is how big of a competitor he was, and Will knows this story too, right? So we're playing this game called Tonk, and and I'm beating him out of his money, all right? And and I'm beating him, and this is about eleven o'clock at night. This guy does not go home until seven o'clock in the morning until he wins all of his money back. Seven. Seven. <laughs> and they had you know, a game that day. Yeah, they had a game that day. We we played them that day. Okay? And the thing is, is that most people will say, oh, my God, Michael Jordan's off my house. Oh, you know, I was ready for Michael Jordan to leave. <laughs> I was like, dude, would you please go, just leave, please? <laughs> but he wouldn't until he won all of his money back. That's how psychotic of a competitor he is. I also laugh because... I love Baxter Holmes for ESPN. I think he does an amazing job. And he talks yeah. about the NBA culture. You know, he, he yeah. doesn't just write the stories about the NBA in general. One of his best was the peanut butter and jelly sandwich obsession. Another <laughs> one is talking about wine and Greg Popovich and his love for wine. You know that, Will. Oh, yeah. But another one was the importance of sleep in the NBA and the travel schedules. And here yeah. you are telling me that the greatest has no problem being up until seven for pennies to him. For pennies. And it, it wasn't, I mean, it was, it was a couple thousand dollars, but it wasn't a lot of money. It was just, he had to win, you know, he had to get it or, or he couldn't let me beat him. You so know, I, I, to take that a step farther. Yeah. When I got traded to San Antonio. Yeah. So now these guys have already played on the, the, the dream teams already happened. All this stuff's already gone down. I get traded to San Antonio. And one of the first things that David Robinson says to me, Michael Jordan's got to deal with the devil. There's, there's no way you can do the things that he does and live the lifestyle that he lives and be as effective as a player. Yes. And I just started laughing because then the stories from, you know, the dream team came out to where those guys would basically, let's just start with practice. They'd get on the bus to go to practice, come back from practice go straight to the golf course, come yeah. back from the golf course, mm -hmm. straight to the casino, stay there until it's time to go to practice, go to practice. So Rob, Dave said he tried to keep up with these guys. He goes, I just physically couldn't do it. He goes, that guy's got to deal with the devil. There's no way you can do all these things outside of basketball and still step foot on the basketball court and drop 50 on somebody. <laughs> you know, we, And that's the next dynasty, the Admiral. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, exactly how Will described it is exactly how this guy lived, you know. And like we we were playing we were playing the uh, the Bulls here in Chicago. I was with the New Jersey Nets at the time, and Jimmy Jackson is just giving it to Michael and Scotty in the first half. He just you know just killing them, right? So Jimmy Jackson starts talking crap and everything. So Michael looks at him. This is this is in the first half. Michael looks at him, and say, you know what? He he used another word, but he says you're talking a lot of crap to have my shoes on. Oh, <laughs> Jimmy Jackson didn't score another bucket that game. <laughs> you talk about the ultimate shutdown, man. J Jimmy looked down; he did have his shoes on. He had the jump man. <laughs> I that that's where you just you're standing there, you and you see him look at him, and then he looks down, and she's like, oh, "Yeah, we're, we're done here." <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't you can't say anything after that. You know, I love that so much. But yeah, that's that's the thing that uh, I think my takeaway, and it's been floating around recently. For everybody who says, when are you guys going to stop talking about the last dance? Never. never. The answer is never. never. No. It I, came yeah. out at the perfect time. And that's the biggest insight we've ever gotten into Michael Jordan. But the clip that where he seemed to show the most emotion was when he talked about how the price of winning and what he had to do to himself and his teammates. You remember the one where he says, that's it, we have to cut? Yeah. And it's at the end. That was the one where he was the most emotional. And you could see there was some sort of... I don't know if it was a feeling of remorse there or just flashing back to those moments, but something tells me he's doing things that he doesn't even want to necessarily do, but he knew he had to do to, to keep that drive going. Yeah, I think so. Will can answer that question better than I can because he was around him. So. But you know the clip that I'm talking Yeah, I know the clip. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's the thing that I learned later on right? about him because, you know, at the moment you're just focusing on games, you're focusing on playing. Um, 
was, and that's the one thing he never really revealed, yeah. is where he got that from. I don't know if he got that from his mom, his dad, that he saw the bigger picture of knowing, because that's the, that's the one thing I always talk about, of knowing what it actually is going to take to win championships and the sacrifices that you have to make. Because I always laugh now, like after the last dance came out, you got all these players talking about, oh man, Michael Jordan, I'm not letting him talk to me like that. That, that would never happen. You know, he's not going to disrespect me. And I'm like, well, that's probably the problem of why you've never been on a championship team because this, did I like how he talked to me? No. But when you start looking at the bigger picture and you think about what you're trying to accomplish, it was like, you know, the things you want to focus on are petty. I was fortunate enough that, you know, it wasn't just Michael Jordan. It was also uh, Bill Cartwright and John Paxson. And the ability of these guys to take what he says, pick it apart, and then put it back together to where you're just like, hey, Bill used to always talk about Cartwright. Just, just look at the bigger picture. Don't focus so much on how he says something, but think about what he's saying. Because if you take it personal, this is this whole thing's going to go south. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just – and the, the biggest – thing we had the the biggest moment to me was um when Bill Cartwright stepped up to talk to the team and his discussion was about sacrifice how we were totally screwing this thing up and he literally you know you think Bill Cartwright's is badass and he literally starts crying in front of the whole team because he can see what's happening about how this is slipping away because of what we're not doing because we're bickering amongst each other and guys are bitching and moaning about this and that. And he's like, you guys don't understand how good we are and what's, what's right at our fingertips. Cause you guys want to make this personal and you want to make it about you. If you just put all that behind you and think about playing and just winning, just think about winning. Don't think about how many points you score, how many rebounds you have, just do whatever you got to do to win. All this stuff will go away. It'll become secondary. But because of what he had been through, the injuries that he had had, I mean, I think people forget Bill Cartwright was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Yeah, he was. It was like one of the best college basketball players of all time mm-hmm. at San Francisco. Yep. But that's just him going through the physical uh, pain that he had to deal with with injuries and what he dealt with, with in New York. And now he has the ability to win a championship. And this little petty stuff is going to keep us from – and he just literally stood up, and it was almost like out of the movies. He literally stood up and kind of like pushed Phil aside and like gave Phil the Heisman and just boom, in the little locker room in the stadium. couple questions for you. Number one, we talk a lot about Jason Hayward's speech in Game 7 of the World Series and what mm. that meant. And a lot of times fans will say, okay, well, what did that really mean? Or you, you see what he's getting paid and his offensive output, and we're not – we're not stupid here, but here you are telling me about something that resonated with you that was not on the court, that didn't have to do with on the court production, and that it mattered. And then secondly, building on that, we've talked a lot about good to great when it comes to a lot of these mm-hmm. playoff teams. I use the White Sox as an example all the time mm-hmm. on this show because you shouldn't just be happy to get to the playoffs. Right, That's not you why yeah. you're here. Right. And, if, and the idea of what that limits you doing if you're just thinking about the playoffs. And I think that speaks to what obviously the last dance was about. Like when you think you've done enough, you still have to do more. Mm -hmm. And then knowing that it's not just what you're seeing on the court, but stuff like this, it does matter. So can you talk about that being good to great? And then also how much those discussions from other players will actually affect you and turn into wins and losses. And that's where I think Kendall and I talk about this on the show a lot is even to this, I'm curious because I, I don't, play now I just watch it right but the one thing that Michael taught me that Bill Cartwright taught me that John Paxson taught me even Bill Lambeer about just you would somehow find a way to dislike your opponent to come to to look at them as the enemy and they basically have something that you want and you desire 
And I watch the game now, and these guys are always talking amongst each other. It's like the game was over last night, and they're all hugging and, you know, dapping each other and stuff like that. And I just, I, I wonder sometimes if that affects the killer instinct or lack thereof that some Exchange, really exchanging jerseys after right, the game and everything. Some, yeah. some players have because of they're a little too concerned about what other players think and what other players feel. Because as you talk about that segment with Michael, it'll take this full circle. Yeah. He knows that there's players to this day that hate him because of how he played, the mentality that he had, but he doesn't care. He What he looks at is, look what I helped you accomplish. And where would you be without me? And some people may may say that that's just that's wrong that's the that's the wrong attitude but is there is there a better a, a more competitive individual and let's also talk about Tom Brady mm-hmm. Tom Brady is not a if, if you literally if you really follow Tom Brady unless you're a true competitor you can you could probably say he's not very likable Right or petty or chip on the shoulder, whatever whatever phrase you want to use to describe. Yeah, I mean that, that was evident when he ran over to the coach the other day and said, you know, told him what he told him. <laughs> he yeah. didn't shake Nick Foles' hand. Right, yeah. that's a dude he lost a Super Bowl to. Right, but if you want to call it petty, you call it petty. But that's what separates, as you just talked about, good from great, of pushing yourself to that point and being like, you know what, I don't give a crap what that other guy thinks. His, his opinion may be important to somebody else, but I'm trying to accomplish something bigger here. And that's where chemistry is so important of not only a team getting along, but truly recognizing what it is you're trying to accomplish and realizing sometimes less is more, meaning you can accomplish more by actually doing less. You know, and, and, and I actually experienced that from the other side, watching them work. I remember we were playing in New Jersey one time, right. and Michael comes down, and he's like, MF and Harp, what the you doing, Harp? This and that of Harp, and I and I looked at Ron Harper. I'm talking about, and I said, Ron, you let him talk to you like that. Ron just shrugs his shoulders like this. Says, That's what I got to do. Business, business, man. You know, and then, and then and Michael used to ride these guys all the time. I mean, because I'm hearing it, he's not saying it to me because I'm on the opposite team, but. You know, he's, he's riding these guys all the time and pushing them to be the best. Another example is when Scotty Burrell, who was sort of his whipping boy in the last dance, uh, Scotty used to play with me in Charlotte and New Jersey. And when he came here with the Bulls, you know, we come to Chicago. I'm like, hey, hey, what's up, Scotty? How you doing, man? How you like it over here? He's like, oh, it's okay. I'm talking to him doing warm-ups. He's like, oh, it's okay. I'm just trying not to make Michael mad. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> He's, I'm like, this guy must be a tyrant, man. And he's a coach now, and he's worn that really well, I'd say. He has.